Welcome everybody uh, to our fifth uh, webinar of this biological webinar series. Um, again, want to go through a little housekeeping rules. Uh, everybody is muted. If you have questions, you can type them in the Q&A box and uh, we'll try to get as many of them answered at the, at the end of the presentation as we can. Uh, we're going to kind of go a little bit different route today. We've got Austin Cisneros with Elevate Ag. He is the um, he is the product production manager for um, Elevate Ag. So he, he does a little bit of everything for Elevate Ag from making the product to, to selling it, to traveling all over, uh, to visit with guys to help them apply it to their farms. Uh, prior to that, he was, a, he was an elementary school teacher. And um, after, after COVID, the uh, remote teaching, he just, he wanted to find something that was going to he felt more helpful. So he, uh, with his background in cattle and, and how he enjoys, enjoys the uh, microbiome, uh, my, gut microbiome and figuring that out with cattle, he just thought the uh, soil health part was a, was a perfect fit. So uh, Austin and Scott Scheimer from Cheyenne Wells, Colorado, he is a farmer down in there, um, row crop farmer down in Cheyenne Wells, uh, uses some Elevate Ag products is also one of the farmer dealers down in that area. So Austin and Scott are going to have kind of a little conversation and kind of go over what Scott has seen in a very dry, I would say, almost desert-like area in, in that part of the world. So I'll let you guys take it away. Well, right, thanks, Dylan. Dylan. Go ahead, Scott. Thanks, Dylan. Yeah. Yeah, one more thing before you guys start. Um, Austin's sharing his screen. His video is not working, so that's kind of why you're not going to see Austin did, uh, today just a little heads up but yeah and ahead. he's got the prettiest face in this whole group so that's unfortunate <laughs> yeah I, I i guess i'll kick it off um i got introduced to elevate ag about three four years ago i think now with travis craft and, and uh we were always trying to look for a new way to uh improve our soil health and we're in a really tough area and uh, like i've said and touted to Austin, it's become the hypergrow product has been the staple in our fertility program. And the reason we're using it is uh, just trying to create soil health beyond just our uh, regular fertilizers. And uh, we definitely had some tremendous success. Like Dylan says, we are in a super dry region. And uh, even last year, I had our crops rode off and uh, we, we did not think during wheat harvest that we would harvest a single acre of our uh, spring crops, corn or milo, and we ended up cutting every acre. It wasn't dynamic, but uh, I really attribute a lot of it to the practices and the product that we're using. Yes. So uh, Scott's kind of talked to us about some things that you're seeing as far as, you know, what, what the hypergrow, what are some of the benefits that you're seeing, you know? Uh, plant health. <laughs> Yeah, visual wise, you know, we get through the heat of the day. And of course out here, you know, we can get with our transpiration and our, our sandy soils, you know, we can get to 105 degrees and uh, that old corn, even at 10 a.m. starts curling up on the neighbors. And uh, we've shared some photos with Austin and with the Elevate Ag. Our, our corn, even in the middle of the day, is still laying out flat. Uh, just healthy soil was, was really proving a healthy plant. Where we really saw it too was um, when we get that that morning mist, you know, maybe it's just, just enough to get your windshield wet. Uh, our corn was really thriving on that where everything else around that wasn't treated with the product was not. It was your typical looking like pineapple and uh, especially on the corn end. And uh, we've seen that for the last three years and we started with trial plots, and now it's just now we use hypergrows just a staple part of our product. Excellent. Yeah, so kind of bouncing off of uh, what Scott said is, um, again, I apologize for my video. Believe it or not, I was a remote teacher for a year, so you would think I'd be an expert at, at Zoom, but uh, appears to be otherwise. Uh, I, I've really enjoyed working with Scott and, and his story. Um, just kind of hear him talk about it. he's a really passionate guy, as you can tell, and he uh, is definitely a think outside the box sort of guy, whether it's uh, shrimp farming or uh, all the adventures that he he gets into. Uh, we I've talked to Scott about a couple different things and he's always 
right there to say, yeah, let's try it. Whatever, what, 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 let's, so he's willing to jump on board right away. So I appreciate that. Um, he's fun to work with. So with kind of Scott is, you know, the benefits we're getting out of Hypergrow are working with that biology and getting, just like you said, just a little bit of moisture, you know, just that would show up on the windshield with, with working on this, you know, four years of using Hypergrow and continuing to build on that biology. That's those microbes in there working for you and continuing to cycle just that little bit of moisture, even, you know, as dry as it is out there, if you can just get a little bit of dew or any moisture, they're just like you and I, you know, take a drink of water and, and it goes a lot further when you have healthier soil, you're able to retain more moisture and just kind of keep those, that biology primed up so that as your plant gets stressed from, you know, the elements of mother nature, you are kind of able to get to that little bit, you know, get a little further, help make some management decisions and just kind of keep a little bit of power in your hand, you know, uh, to, to get to that next rainer to help with those management uh, decisions. And, um, you know, it's great that to hear you say, you know, you were able to harvest every acre and so you're seeing the benefits in it. Um, we kind of talked a little bit about some of our other products as far as hypercycle goes and, and the importance of, you know, kind of looking at that for the fall as how we can kind of get another harvest out of that residue and, and we're able to pull those nutrients down and really build a nice um, biome for that incoming seed in the spring. And just the importance of, of just trying to build this soil health up so that we're able to, you know, one, promote a healthy environment for the seed coming in, but just get the most out of our ground and, and try to, you know, make a healthier product at the end of the day and, and try to, you know, help with the ROI, which is what truly I, I enjoy the most is just kind of getting these guys to, to make these changes and, and walk along these journeys. And I guess that's, that's what I really enjoy about working with Elevate Ag. So. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, what we do too is a, you know, the bottom line is everything. You even have it up here, profitable farming. Um, that's kind of the staple of my operation and the, the program I developed, Simple Farms, is to track all that. But we, the last few years, have just shifted our input dollars of our fertility. And uh, years ago, I've uh, been going to these no-till conferences, regenerative ag, trying to find a way to make this really work for our operation. Every one of us is different. And the decision I made was, all right, we're going to adopt some of these new products, the hypergrowth, some of these other biologicals. And uh, the way we're going to do is we're just going to shift our fertility dollars. We already know we're going to spend so much on 1034-0, 32-0. So let's just shift these dollars into these new products. And not we're not trying to replace anything. We're just supplementing. And these last couple of years, as dry as we've been, we still stick with our biologicals and put our soil to work and that's what i was hearing early on in these conferences is hey you guys we're working so hard pushing our fertilizers instead of just really letting this soil go back to work for us and uh utilize what you're seeing tied up out there and the elevate ag products are exactly that that direction that's what you guys are looking at and that's the hyper cycle like austin brought up is something we really want to introduce is uh getting it where it's breaking down some of this heavier residue. We're feeling quite fortunate that we're going to have some fields this year that maybe we got more residue than we can manage with our, our equipment. So if we can break it down with biologicals and put that right back in the soil to work for us and still be able to get through with the, uh, the planting equipment we have, I, I'm really excited to use it that way and just get away from all these other mechanical tools that we've had to use historically to get us a stand. Yeah. Um, I don't, did you, Scott, did you mention that you're using hypergrow and furrows that we, did you tell them the process of that? Yeah. Yeah. So okay. uh, all our equipment for years has been set up with liquid. Uh, even my air drill, I've designed my own systems and uh, uh, yeah, our air drill for years has, we put liquid in furrow, our planter, we put all our liquid in furrow. So we're trying to get it there with the plant. Now we have, if we feel like we things are looking really good, good success here, we're talking about this year with our wheat, a couple of weeks here, we'll be out top dressing, looking to put hypergrow on top as well, and probably some of this fish fuel to really accelerate the biology. Yeah. And so the the 
you know, what's why the inferro is so important. I mean, full year is great, but, and, you know, obviously um, Elevate Ag, at Elevate Ag, we just want to work with the producer where they're at with the, the things that they're implementing. And so um, inferro, if we can get it there uh, and build a, get that seed started right, kind of stilling off David Olson from last week, as he always said, a healthy seed is a healthy plant. And so um, that's extremely beneficial to kind of keep all that biology right there get it in the soil so when that seed that that is our future you know that's our dollars in, in the field and so create as good of an environment for that as we can and really get that plant promoted from the get-go and and with helping with there's so many benefits with uh drought stress and you know pests and weeds and all these things it's really neat when we kind of uh get to really get this soil working for us or for the producers, the, the different things that you see outside of what you're truly after your goal, I guess. And that's kind of, uh, you and I have had that conversation a couple of times, Scott, it's just kind of weeds and, and the pests that have, you know, you've seen the different, the benefit or the, the difference in since using product. And so, um, and kind of bouncing off or stealing off your, you know, your soft fly issue that you were talking about the other day. So, um, yeah, yeah. With the, with the kites in and, uh, that plant, you know, we just, I guess it's hard to grasp as a farmer, you know, we've, we're doing a lot of things. We're wearing a lot of different hats and the science that's coming out with the biologicals and all the, the all the plant health. There's a lot wrapping our minds around and, and learning about. And uh, I'm always learning and finding where that initial treatment by the seed and the plant carries that all the way through its life and creates that protection, almost that immune system like you and I have as uh, you know, it's, it makes sense now, but you don't think about all that at that point. Uh, one thing we did see, even in this high stress year as well, we didn't raise great crops, but we still had great quality. And I think that was another huge dynamic. You know, we I can remember historically, if we had a four year moisture wise and everything, we just didn't have very good quality grain either, whether it was the wheat, the Milo test weights or anything. But this year, even our corn, we had fields that only yielded in the teens. We went ahead and picked them. But uh, we're still shipping 59-pound test weight corn. Uh, we didn't get below 57-pound test weight corn in super extreme drought conditions. I, I think that translates a lot to this biological all the way to the end result to your grain. Yeah. Um, trying to think what, what other things we've discussed. So. What's kind of been uh, some of your key takeaways since implementing these biologies, I guess, or what would you tell guys going going forth, you know, like what's some advice, I guess, that you have for some of these guys, Scott? I, I think the key one is communication with you guys. Uh, we, we find ourselves kind of blowing and going. When it's planting time, uh, kind of everything goes out the window. Uh, you guys might have told us not to mix this with that. I, I think it's important with everybody out there to definitely communicate with your supplier, the provider of the products and Elevate Ag is excellent about communicating back is uh, be careful what you mix these products with. They will cause problems if you introduce them with the wrong other products. Uh, you know, mix it in a jug or in a bucket before you introduce it all together because there are problems when you're putting the biologicals together with certain synthetics and other products. They they don't all get along. They all look like liquid to begin with, but boy, can they make a mess. And we've definitely had our experiences here where uh, we mixed some products and really had a mess. And uh, I think it's important for everybody to communicate and just really lay out a game plan of how they're going to mix this product and what they're going to use before they introduce it when it's blow and go time and you're all slugged up. That's that's no much not much fun. Yeah, I I agree. When you know we we really strive to keep that constant communication. So when we're working with producers, the more information you can give us, the the um, the better it's going to be and the faster we can make a plan. And I mean, you know, it's it's like Scott said, we're we're working with living biology. So not only is these microbes cycling, uh, you know, water and and carbon and nitrogen and doing and freeing up these nutrients for us, you know, increasing the photosynthesis and and but it, it's we're working with living things. And so um, we we kind of got to keep that in mind and know that when we put these microbes in and give them a food source, you know, that they're going to go to work. And so we want to make sure that we get them to work in the soil where we want them. 
and not in a you know in a tank setting or something like that and so uh we we're, we try to be very conscious of that and we've tried to get you know all of our ducks in a row as far as that goes but these are it's it, it's it, that's what makes it fun i guess in a sense but you also kind of we need to be aware of it and so um yeah uh, yeah, we we've created some science projects. Uh, Jim, that's with me. He's kind of our we call him our Sir Mix a lot, and uh, we pulled a shuttle out that was molasses. Thought it had it pretty rinsed, and uh, he he added the the uh, hypergrowth to it, and we had a volcano in no time. And uh, he had to run home and change. <laughs> it, it, it can get kind of funny too. <laughs> yeah. Oh. So let's see what else have we discussed. Oh, um, weeds. We've had some inter interesting conversations. That's been a book we've been cracking into and talking quite a bit about. Um, it's the importance of how, what those, you know, um, I'm sure everybody's heard it before that weeds aren't, you know, they, they are a good sign, a good indicator of what's going on in the soil. And um, I was telling Scott a couple weeks ago about how I been driving down the road and I look out in fields and I'm like, oh, I know, I know what's, what that is, why that's there, you know, what's in. So we kind of went down a rabbit hole on that. And <laughs> but that's, that's what makes it fun. I guess that's what I, why I enjoy it is, you know, I um, just, you, you, you look at things a little differently, I guess that so you, you start to, to just kind of really dive into this and, and, you know, for lack of a better term, you know, you kind of really get down into the dirt a little bit and it's what makes it fun. Um, it's the No, I agree, Austin. The, the, the thing I catch myself all the time is, is I, I try to be progressive, but I still catch myself locked in the box of this is how we've always done it. And uh, it's, it's, I find it very important to go out and ask questions to everybody just like you and, and look at what our fields are doing and how can we make this better? We're fighting these weeds. Is there a different route of curing this problem? Soil health's a big one. Uh, let's kind of try to cure our problems with soil health instead of with uh, with more chemicals. And uh, you've opened my eyes to that. And uh, that's definitely a process we're looking forward to trying this year is introducing more humix and other things to uh, and cutting back on certain fertility structures to uh, just have a healthy plant and prevent the weed pressure. Yeah, I mean, as we you know continue down this road and like you were talking about earlier, the programs of implementing fish and feeding that fungal, and as we continue to increase that fungal population and and get them to work, that it's less nutrients that are tied up and and they're cycling, and that's what makes it where you don't have an excess of of one you know nutrient or another to to create that home for for weeds and. And it's really neat that as you get that, you know, continue to feed that and we continue to turn that biology up and the microbes and get that bacterial population in balance and get everybody kind of give them a job that they're able to use up those nutrients so that you're, you you help with the weed suppression and stuff. And so, yeah, I mean, it all starts with healthy soil, like you've said, like, you know, we see it. So. Hey, Austin, we got a question out there from Jim first. Uh, he's asking about the soil temperature. Uh, what's your answer on that as far as making a difference with applying these products? Uh, is soil temp, I mean, we'd like to see, you know, uh, just that plant, I guess what our ground's telling us, if the plant starts to photosynthesize and it starts to warm that ground up, then, you know, just then, then we can go out and start to pull those samples. The biggest thing is just staying consistent with when you do it. Um, you know, if you pull it in the fall, your first year, make sure that you continue to pull it in the fall so that you can see or in the spring or whenever it is, just stay consistent with it so that when you're looking at things in the big scope of it, that your data is cons just consistent from the get go. And so that's, you know, whenever you, the soil starts to warm up and you're like, OK, here, here's when I think is a good time. It's whatever's easiest for you. And then we can kind of just the biggest key is just keeping it consistent. We've got another one here from Dennis. He's asking Austin, has the hypergrowth changed with the ingredients? I uh, see the main ingredient. Is it still a compost extract from uh, Johnson Sioux? So the ingredients in hypergrowth are the same. What, what it is, if we extract from a 
highly fungal population. And then we've added some, you know, warm castings. And as far as we're not extracting a Johnson Sioux, we went through and pulled, um, kind of done the engineering on this and figured out what each one of these components are bringing for us. And that's what we've added as our extract, which is highly, highly fungal. And that's kind of what gets out there and gets that biology promoted. And then we've also got, you know, some trace minerals in there, some humic acids and stuff like that, that we know are beneficial. And so we can get them and get that, like kind of going back to that infer or foliar, what's that plant going to need? And how can we promote this through the fungal, taking the fungal with a home or a food source and really get them. So when they get in that environment, that they're able to turn up and get to work. Uh, Mark, you're asking uh, hypergrow with sugar, like a Centos FA. Uh, the only sugar we've introduced it to was uh, uh, molasses, and uh, that that did not work out well. Things really got excited there. Um, so <laughs> we, we've stopped doing that. I don't know about the three sugar with the fulvic acid. I think that's definitely an answer for Austin to throw out there. So he's doing a sugar with a fulvic, is that what he's getting? Yeah, the three sugar, a Cintos FA with the, basically a three sugar with a fulvic. Okay. Um, yeah, it, it's, you know, the sugars are, tend to be more of a bacterial food versus a fungal. It's, it, it, you can, you can use them, you know, they, they're going to feed that microbe. It's just, it, you know, the sh it's how long that food source is going to last. and. Um, what what you're getting out of it, I guess, is the thing I would look at it. You know, fulvic is great for getting it into a plant absorption, help them transport that and make it readily available and being a food source as well for microbes. But it's, um, I would, I, I guess I get nervous with, with molasses as well. It, you know, it, it's got a place. It's just, you gotta, you know, we gotta know where we're at and what we're gonna mix it with. Um, but I, I would steer more towards a fish um, you know, Pacific Grow, Oceanic Hydrolysate, uh, TNT, high energy fish, just to get more bang for our buck out of that, wow, for that food. And, and those fish products are fungal food. So what, are we trying to promote a fungal, popula a fungal population or a bacterial population? And so kind of that's how we look at that and then decide what, where we want to plug in a food source at. And that's kind of going to be our approach this year. So we're going to mix more of the fish product with the hyper grow. Correct. See how that acts. Yep. more questions yeah armin was throwing out there um the hyper grow we've been using it with our milo the last few years and uh it's uh, definitely helped our chlorosis issues on our milo we haven't seen near the yellowing we did a little more this last year only because uh, we did not get any rain when we had that milo but once we got some rain it snapped out of it but the years before when we've had a little moisture out there Really, with our Milo, we've got such a high pH calcification and uh, tied up iron. When we add that hypergrow in, our Milo has really thrived with that. Uh, yeah, the next I, go go ahead. ahead. Just about, you know, continuing on that is just as we continue to increase this fungal populations, we create such a healthy environment that these, you know, problems that we have aren't, don't have as great of a chance to come in and move we built too good of a home for them to come into and thrive and so it it starts with that fungal and getting that biology going and getting this cycling that 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 helps you know eliminate all these issues that we have whether rust or you know chlorosis or you know whatever it is it, it, these these things they thrive on um weak i guess for for lack of a better term is you know it's like a mountain lion doesn't pick the, the biggest bull elk on the hill, on the mountain, you know, he picks the old or the, the young or something. And, and so I guess it, that's, it, it's the same thing. It's biology. We're just talking in a different food web. And, and as we continue to create a better, healthier plant with a higher functioning soil, we're able to get rid of those predators. And so that's why we're able to eliminate some of these things. That, that is why we are. So. I, the next question, I, I guess I'll just tell my little story here with Oryx Asin. Um, do you have some comparison yields when using Hypergrow compared to not using it? And uh, we really, the selling port for us was uh, three years ago. 
we uh, we tried one field with the hyper grow and another without. This ground has been in my family since the 50s. We have farmed it identical. It was just across the road from one another, and uh, it was a super dry year. In fact, uh, we had insurance come out and adjust the corn that was not treated, and the corn right across the road. Everything was identical historically for years and years in every aspect plant dates, population, seed types, all the other fertility. The only variable was hypergrow, and uh, we saw a 32 bushel an acre yield difference, I believe is what it was. And we have photos of that. We shared that with Elevate Ag. I think that's extreme. It's in an extreme environment, but we definitely, that was a huge selling point to us is uh, that's what it did. And obviously we've been so synthetic for years the, the hyper grow was doing a lot of things for our soils, bringing out a lot that it had been tied up for years and really accelerated that in our growing crops. So, yeah, we uh, we definitely have seen some yield increase results. Those aren't ones I would tout all the time, but for us in Eastern Carbs is a huge selling point. Yeah. And, and you know, it, it kind of going with your off of the synthetics is, you know, as we're we cut back or reduce we're able to preserve more and more of that biology so it's there you know for us in the spring and that's what leads to those things that you've got nutrients that have been broke down that are available because your microbes are able to survive and continue to work for you um hypergerm is another one you know down uh southern part of the state guys using our hypergerm product our seed treatment and you know kind of having great success as far as weed suppression on soybeans um you know three to five bushel increase on beans as well so it's just kind of what you're, you know, Scott bouncing off what you're saying. It's just, it's, it's interesting when you get it in environments to see kind of the benefit, different benefits and, and things that, you know, different producers and farmers see, so. Uh, Jim Culp's firing out there. What is the cost of uh, this product? I assume he's asking for the hyper growth cost. Okay, uh, in furrow would be 1050 and foliar would be 14 an acre. So 1050 in furrow and $14 an acre foliar. So you're talking about a gallon and a half an acre like, foliar or uh, in, in furrow. In $2 or and two gallons about. foliar, yep. And, and it's a good start, you know, and, and kind of off of what I said earlier is, you know, let's send a food source with that so that we can get more bang for a buck out of our biology. They're just like you and I, you know, it, they like they need food to continue to work and to continue to, to, you know, they can't work on an empty stomach as well, so. All right, Mark's asking out there, can you mix hypergerm with Amplify L for a seed treatment on corn or wheat? I guess I'm not familiar with Amplify L. Yeah, I'm not either. I, I, I'm not either. Sorry, Mark, maybe we can find that out. Uh, Ken Overcast asking, have you had any experience with uh, anionic soil amending agents to help with the tight soils. Is there any negative consequences for the biology? Um, let's see. So if we get, if we're, if you mix our uh, biology, any products with any form of a synthetic, um, it's, we want to be the last thing in the tank to go. So this is a living biology so as it sets in that you know you're it, we're not going to destroy all of it but you know and we're able to crank our populations up so high that we do lose some but not there's we're still taking such a high population out that you're still getting benefits it's just you know get get it in the tank and and get that biology to work for you it's not doing any good sitting in a tank so we want to get it out and get it in the ground and as far as the hyper german and the amplify l you know, we haven't had any issues. I would, you know, before I say yes, I would want to see, you know, a tag or something and just kind of talk to the producer more about that just so that I, I know that, you know, what I, what's, what's going on so we can kind of get in front of ourselves that there isn't going to be an issue. So. And Jim's asking, uh, have you tried detox the soil, tried to detox the soil before applying the products? I, I have not, I don't know even the process or it's an interesting question. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not familiar with it either. Uh, Roger asks, uh, fish hydrosate with the hypergrow in the same tank. Um, we did it 
pre yeah we did it this year doing our rye and uh had no problem had no problem mixing the two together in our tank and uh we carry saddle tanks on our drills and so we had over a thousand gallons of it mixed together and drilled the whole section and didn't have a problem doing that yeah, and that's just um again when you you know call and talk about products you know we need to know nozzle sizes filters all of those sort of things you know as a tighter mesh filter it's you know doing exactly what you put it on your equipment for and to, to filter more things out and sometimes you know uh it will cause issues but just we just need to talk through those things is all yeah armin was actually here doing it with us so we we had the guru here helping us mix. <laughs> So he was going to be the one wearing it if we had an issue. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we got Dennis here. Uh, speak to what products originate with, with David Olson's continued to use the product to see if it has brought plant sugars up. Oh, wait, it just jumped on me while I was asking that. Speak to what products originate with David Olson's sustainable solutions and what products are from other sources, any sources cultured in a lab? So we work well, uh, very closely with David Olson. Um, and as far as our products go, we've, you know, been able to, uh, I guess on a large scale, instead of, you know, I guess building our resources, using our resources, you know, the best that we can so that we're able to get product out here for, ourselves as well as you know david and so uh it's uh, none are cultured in a lab it's all living biology and we just crank that population up so high and continue to feed them so that we can have those high populations and so so there is no cultured lab it's this their extraction from a fungal and we just continue to crank them and feed them up and make them extremely high in fungal or extremely high in bacterial wherever our situations are and so um yeah i guess that answer hopes that answers all right matt's asked uh have you checked bricks levels on your crops as you have continued to use the product to see if it has brought up plant sugars um we haven't checked bricks levels on my end uh what we do do is we use the uh, grain sense uh device and we track in what we've seen is the protein levels in the corn has been up in the 16%. Uh, I think that translates a little bit to that aspect and our test weights have held well, but I think maybe Austin's seen more of what the BRICS levels have done. Yeah, uh, I really enjoy the BRICS. Uh, when like, it's a great quick uh, observation that we can go and get from, a, from our crops. Uh, if we're, I guess, as far as plant health goes, so, you know, a fungicide or a herbicide, go out and pull that bricks level, know where you're at. And, and you know, if it, another thing is if we wonder if these synthetics are doing anything, go, uh, go pull it before and after, you know, but that's what's making, uh, like Scott's saying, he hasn't pulled a bricks, but that's what he's seeing in his plants. His bricks levels are going up, which are making these insect pressure, these fungal pressures, that's what's making them go away. The, so as far as pulling it, but I, enough, I've you know been around them and done enough of them that we know that that's what's happening is that brick level is moving up because that plant is photosynthesizing more and more. As it photosynthesizes through the biology, it's able to use more, which it goes back to plant health. So healthy soil, you know, turns up if that plant is able to pull more nutrients up into the plant, which takes you know it can photosynthesize more, shoot more sugars down into the ground, and kind of speed that cycle up, which in you know. A benefit of that is an increased bricks level, which, you know, is the domino effect to fungal and pest and all these other issues. But bricks is something that's a really cheap tool, you know, cheap tool to have for producers. I am constantly talking to guys about it because I think it's 25, 30 bucks. I don't really remember. And it it's a really quick assessment. Uh, you know, if you want to dive in deeper. A sap analysis is, is is the next step up from there, and where that's where you pull your top and your bottom leaf, you send them in, and it tells you exactly what's in that plant, and then you can kind of really get down into the internal of the plant. Where bricks is just a quick snapshot. Uh, it's really neat. Like 
there's a lot of information about it. I've been down lots of rabbit holes with it as far as, you know, when thunderstorms come in and your bricks levels drop, it, you know, it's telling you, hey, you know, it barometric pressure changes that plant's telling you it's it's all part of a, you know, the big picture. So yeah, I could talk about that all day long. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll throw a little rabbit hole at you. Uh, we've got the question, explain the science behind how the hypergerm acts as a weed suppression. So it's, it's over and over again, I'll just keep going back to it. It's a default answer is the biology. It, at the end of the day, it boils down to biology. The more, what we, what leads to weeds are, you know, think about the environment that we're, we're, we're providing for them. Are we, you know, have we pulled soil tests? You know, do we know that we have any excess of anything? Do we know what's out there in the ground for us? Do we know how active our biology is? And so that's kind of where I always go to. And we, as, as we have an excess of nitrogen or, or phosphor, then you kind of go back to our book, Scott, that we, you and I were talking about, you know, when weeds talk and, and let's go in and let's dig into these things and say, oh, this weed likes calcium. Oh, all right. Well, what does calcium tie up? You know, potassium, phosphorus, you know, mag, mag. And, and then all of a sudden you're like, oh, okay. Another thing is form and function, you know, go and look at the weed. If it's got a long taproot, think about how that thing has to get, what type of soil it has to have to grow that root. And so then these kind of things are, then you're able to kind of say, okay, these are my minerals getting tied up. Hey, you know, what's getting tied, you know, why is my biology not moving these things? What am I doing as a producer? And so then we say, okay, well, we need to loosen up, you know, bring a higher fungal population or we need to feed our fungal. Maybe we need to go out there with a the humic acid or, or some sort of molasses to kind of spin things up. And so that's as it all comes down to your what's in your soil, what's getting held up, what's getting moved around that. What, it, what kind of environment are you creating for a weed? Are you, you know, and that's, that's what comes down to it is the biology of it. Tom asks uh, if you guys have a dry seed treatment. We do have a dry seed treatment, um, foundational fungi. Uh, you know, it's, two to four ounces per hundred pounds of seed. It doesn't take a lot, uh, but, you know, again, make sure that we, if we can incorporate some sort of a food source with that, it's, you know, sounds, so just, yeah, we have a dry seed treatment, sorry. Good. Hey, Jim's asking, um, for someone that has never used any biology in area that only gets around 17 inches of rainfall per year, what would you start with? Uh, Jim? We're over here to shine wells. I'm uh they say we're at 12 inch annual. I don't think we've seen that since 2017. Last year, I think we were five inches of rain total. Um the the hyper grow's been my first go-to, and uh we've just kind of so Austin quoted that's about 1050 an acre, and uh we were using about $30 an acre in fertility to get started. So we just shifted about a third of our uh, inputs over to the hyper grow and tank mix that in to get things started. And uh, that was kind of our beginning. And yeah, we're, we're super dry here. And it just blows my mind that we're able to harvest anything with that limited rainfall. But uh, that's definitely, and I, I felt like too, when we first introduced biologicals, I think we really got an accelerated aspect because we've been, our ground's been waiting so long to go to work for us. So uh, yeah, that's that was kind of our beginning is using the hyper grow in our tank mix and seeing these results. Uh, the, the next one, Keith's asking, can you recommend a good bricks, bricks reader device there, Austin? Uh, I just got on Amazon and just type in a refractometer is what it's called. Uh, and then there's all sorts of options. I think mine's in like a blue, like a light blue uh, plastic case. So as far as a brand goes, no, if they type in refractometer on Amazon, they'll pop right up. Hey, we've got uh, Norm. Do you have any opinion about whether the biology is on some level driving the plant to increase photosynthesis to increase root exudates? Absolutely. Yep, that is exactly what that we're after. That's more... exactly what's happening out there. Exactly. You nailed it. Yep. Uh, Clint, 
Austin, can you repeat the name of the book that tells what weeds tell us about soil deficiencies? Uh, it's When Weeds Talk by Jay McCammon. Is that correct? Yeah. It's it doesn't it's not a fancy looking book by any means. I'll, I'll show you guys. I don't know. There you go. There it is. I it's on my desktop. <laughs> and, and 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 it's you know it, it it's open to research. It, you know it, it it is just a good starting piece. So it's you know just a good educational piece. I you know just something to get you started. It just makes you you know think a little bit and look at things a little differently. And so I guess that's what I enjoy about it. I'm gonna type it in for Clint as well. It's called When Weeds Talk by J.L. McCammon, I believe is how you say his last name. And then Galen asked, please give price and use of seed treatments. The rate would be six to eight ounces per hundred pounds of seed. So we need to know your planting population and then what your seed, you know, bag weighs uh, to figure that. And that is $60 a gallon, but again, just six to eight ounces per acre. So it all, you know, depends on planting populations. All right, William says, make sure the refractometer is not the HVAC type. <laughs> yeah, I was talking to a producer and they said that they use it like for they check an antifreeze or something. I don't know. There's different sources. Maybe that's what he was talking about. Huh. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah, get the proper device for plants. It's neat. Yeah, you can, I mean, coffee, your soda, any of that stuff. It's really neat. Nitrates in, in sedan or, I mean, there are so many different uses to it. I recommend carrying a, you know, a pair of vice grips or pliers. Sometimes that tends to help to get some of that um, sugars out of there too. Just, to, I mean, you don't need very much just to drop, but sometimes it's can be a little difficult to get some out of a plant. Scott and Austin, I also did share a link on Amazon for the wind weeds talk and the refractometer you were referring to, Austin. In the, don't hear the in our chat for everybody. You, you are the man. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's the end of the questions at this point. Uh, William just fired out their uh, fruit juice testing type on the refractometer. There you go. Okay, Dennis asks to use hypergrow instead of water for mixing inoculants. Is it okay to use it that way? Um, I would recommend the hypergerm just because of the, you're getting so many more of the benefits for that seed and just helping stick around that coat or yeah, stick into the coat of the, you know, coating that seed, I guess, if I understand that question, right? Yeah. And then Matt's asking something similar. Can we apply hypergrow as a seed inoculate? What results might we observe applying inoculation versus in furrow? Uh, for me, you know, we're talking a volume of a gallon and a half per acre. Uh, I, for me, I, I don't think I'd want to put it on the seed and get it caked up in the tank. But Austin, I guess I'll leave that to you. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. Is you know, Armin's went through these and figured out you know the product and and the and the application, and so uh, it's. For the benefits that you're getting in different, you know, each product, they're bringing something different. And uh, that's why, you know, I, if you're wanting a seed treatment, it's a great start. Uh, and then to come, you know, anytime we can bring biology into things, we're just ramping everything up, introducing a new, you know, introducing that fungal and getting that, you know, feeding on the indigenous species that are out there and kind of turning everything up and get building, diversifying our, our, our biology. And so um, I would, highly re you know recommend a seed treatment it is you know it's six to eight ounces so it's not much to it versus you know you're getting a gallon and a half of product an acre into into that furrow for that more availability more nutrients for that plant yeah so what you're kind of throwing out to uh, matt there is, is use hypergerm if he's wanting to treat his seed is that correct correct yeah okay yeah 
And then Clint, can you talk about MetaGrow, Austin? How is it different from HyperGrow? The fungal population, just a higher fungal population. Would you say too, with our HyperGrow, we talk about the chitosan end is that a difference correct as well yeah, yeah. hypergrowth just got a lot of um nutrients with it a just whether it be a trace mineral you know seaweed humic chitosan all of these other nutrients that we've added into it to which is what what makes it such a great product in furrow is all the other benefits that come with it yeah uh, plant we saw too with the hypergrow We've been, especially in these dry periods, really fighting the grasshoppers on the perimeters. And uh, that chitosan is what's breaking down that exoskeleton mandible. And it's really cut them back. They're not putting near the pressure on us. And we did have an incident down here with one of our fields where we had the saw fly. And uh, we started treating all that area with the uh, hypergrow with the chitosan. And I know that shut those guys down as well. And uh, we, did, we didn't have the problem this last year even with the stressed wheat. So uh, that, I think that's a big one. We really enjoy with the hyper grows the chitin in it, translating that into the plant for its own defense against these uh, insects. And then, uh, you know, the aphids, they're gonna jump onto the neighbors that aren't treating for that and uh, leave us alone. Yeah, and, and hyper grow has metagrow F in it. So uh, you're getting that, that's what's making that high fungal population. But yeah, like you're saying, Scott, it's just, it's, all these benefits that come to it and as that plant's able to cycle it around cycle through it okay i see here jim's asked uh is it better to put your seed treatment on untreated seed versus putting it on seed that comes with several fungicides and insecticides on it yes it's we are bringing high fungal uh pro populations and as it that is that biology has to work through those different coatings, then, you know, we're, it's, you're just, it's that much longer for it to get into the seed where you want it to be. So, um, yeah, a naked seed versus, you know, a tr seed that's been treated a couple times. We're just, we're just stretching that road for that biology to get to your seed is all with those treatments versus a naked seed. It's able to get in there, get right into that seed and, and get going. Well, guys, looks like <clears throat> that might be most of the questions for now. I do have a have a couple maybe to 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 wrap up here. Um, one, Scott, for you, you know, with your with your corn through that drought where you were harvesting some and maybe your neighbors weren't, you know, what what was the buzz word or the talk about maybe you around town, you know, you know, seeing that 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 you were able to you know have a harvest in a in a dry year like that. You know, there wasn't a lot of conversation. We we would, you know, we'd have the dialogue with some of the neighbors and uh but uh you know guys would ask us what we're doing and then they don't believe it. You know, we go through that time period. Uh Austin was just here yesterday. We had a group of our producers and we just keep telling our story and hopefully you know we get through and some of these guys we got a few that are interested now. And, and a great uh, turnout. You had a great turnout last night, I thought. <laughs> yeah thanks it, it was good uh yeah you know it's funny sometimes you get outside of our neighborhood and we can have a lot more open conversation than just locally but uh trying to have that dialogue with all our neighbors and what we're doing different and uh and and we're not all successes i have tremendous failures and i'm always asking my neighbors what their successes are so trying to keep that dialogue open between the two of us what we can learn from each other yeah very good um looks like dennis actually just uh popped in here with a question um you know speak to the persistence in the soil of these products or the need to reapply every year and i, I think that's going to vary from from location to location based on a lot of environmental factors but if you guys can maybe speak to that a little bit yeah i i think that this biology is constantly constantly evolving and as it evolves your soil evolves and so to you know, we can go with similar products, but at the end of the day, we've got to be, you know, we have to know where our soil is at, what's going on in our soil, and then what are our plants telling, what's our, what's the plants telling us. And so it, it is just constant, this learning and evolving and moving target. 
and that's what makes it fun it's it's hard to um you know say hey here here's what we're going to do over and over because we want to continue to go and if we're doing things right we're going to continue to build that fungal population up and so uh it yeah it just takes time and and we just got to kind of continue to to look at things and be observant of everything this this last year was probably our example is uh we stayed persistent with our hyper growth treatment and we we cut back on our synthetics we were so dry we just didn't feel like we were going to push our yields anyway so we stayed persistent with our biology and cut back on our synthetics i don't think we're ever going to replace the synthetics we're just trying to supplement and uh so i guess i'm creating my synthetics as my variable and stay persistent with my biologicals at this point in time. Yeah, Dennis, and I would probably add to that, you know, in order to keep that biology going, you know, a living root is, is key. And, and sometimes that's easier said than done. You know, Scott, I, I believe you're, you're not quite, haven't quite found that niche with the cover crop thing yet in your area. But, uh, but you know, that if, if you can find that opportunity, that certainly can go a long ways to to keeping that biology going that that is really our push i mean we are super dry area we're doing a lot of rotations this year we're working with green cover uh doing cereal rye and uh we're, we're hoping to integrate that more following either our corn or our milo throw some grazing aspects in it or maybe even harvest some of that other for the grain itself my, my ultimate goal with our farm even with this limited rainfall is getting to zero fallow. I would rather be full production year every year and have no fallow acres. We're a ways off from that. We have tried the cover mixes. Uh, I think we jumped in kind of fast in it and uh, it, it hurt us because we went into dry period. So we're going to taper in again. I think there's a place for us. We just got to find that niche and we're testing it as we move along. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, that's, that's, that's great. Uh, you know, Probably one more question I would have, um, you know, when it comes to trying to, I mean, I'm, and I think you guys kind of alluded to this a little bit, but when trying to select what what biological program to go with, where are you doing any, um, Scott, are you doing any Haney tests, PLFA, TDNs, and then Austin, what, what are those would you recommend to maybe get started with to try to, you know, make a plan um, to go down this path? So on my end, uh, we did partner up with Locus Ag. So we are doing their uh, seed treatment biologicals in conjunction with Hypergrow. I mean, we have an ex we have, we are not going away from the Hypergrow Elevate Ag products. We're actually added to the fish fuel this year, so we're just supplementing more. So we are working with Locus, and they are doing the Haney tests on us with that program for the carbon market. And uh, we are waiting on the results right now. So they did Haney for last year, but I don't have the results yet. And it'll be the first round. For years, we had done the soil probe samples, sent them off, and I got tired of seeing any values move for us for years, even in the no-till. So we quit it a long time ago. So now the Haney is going to be the first for us this year. So stay tuned. Uh, so Dylan, what I recommend is, uh, you know, where we're at, but as a as a starting base. Uh, a Haney is great because it tells us what's available to that plant. A TND is a total nutrient digestion. And so how that tells us is what we're able to tap into, what, what our potential is. And so as we turn the biology up through the testing of a PLFA, um, they all kind of work with on, on one another. But to start with, I would say a TND is, you know, a great one to have. And then absolutely a, a Haney and a TND needs to be pulled, you know, every couple years uh it just depends on the producer but a haney i would do you know my rotations just so you can see that these things are becoming because this biology you're it it's going to move these these minerals and nutrients and make them more plant available and ultimately that's that what we're after okay yeah that's that's good good advice hopefully you know be able to get people started um with that, I would say, Scott, Austin, any closing thoughts, any closing advice, to, you know, before we, we uh, get off here? I, I, I think the biggest thing, I guess my lifelong perspective in farming is, is when you look at a field and a crop and your rotations, you don't have very many years to find your success in each field. 
Uh, I really go out and I seek professionals that have a lot more understanding perspective and I keep my mind open and we're trying new things all the time and we're doing them in small scales. And once we see success, we expand with it. But uh, I just say to everybody, keep trying, keep trying new things. We don't have a lot of years to, to get it right. But uh, I think if we keep moving forward and really lean on these guys like Austin with Elevate Ag to help us out and get through our, listen to them, trust them. And uh, I think it'll help you a lot in the future. Good. Thanks, Scott. I, uh, I would say, you know, just kind of echoing on that is, you know, I guess my teaching background is, you know, know your, get some context, get some knowledge on these things, find, educate yourself so that you're, you're able to have those, those questions that are, you know, thought provoking and that continue to keep you hungry and moving and, and, you know, you're, you're able to build on this knowledge and, and gather an understanding of it. And that's, that's what makes it fun is, is all of these, you know, little tools and, and finding out, you know, weeds and just, there's so many things that, and, and just, yeah, be open-minded and, and eager to learn and just, and just stay active with it, start, get started. And, and, you know, we're not, it's don't start with a, all your acres. Don't pull the plug hundred percent on your synthetics. Like these are steps. It's, it's a journey. It's, it's not something that we're going to flip our finger, you know, snap our fingers and tomorrow we're, we're in a whole different world. It, it's a step. It's a journey. It takes processes and, and practices and principle changes and mindset. And um, I look forward to, you know, doing this for a long time. So, yeah, you're right, Austin. I'm actually on my 32nd year of farming. I took it over for my granddad at the age of 19. Uh, uh, it's still a heck of a journey, and I could never imagine trying to jump in all this at once. It's It's been that whole journey, and uh, it, it takes a long time. But uh, I think patience and perseverance will pay off. Yeah. Well, very good. Yeah. Uh, gentlemen, thank you for, for taking time out of your day to, you know, to continue this biological, biological webinar series. Um, you know, you can certainly – get in contact with, with Elevate Ag for any of these products or, or any of us uh, green cover sales reps will be happy to help you along with that. Um, again, this, this will be recorded and posted on our YouTube page. So if you want to go back and rewatch it, uh, there's, there's opportunity there. Next week, same time, uh, we're going to have Laura Decker on and she is going to be talking about the, how to use the microbi microbiometer and, and its many uses. So Thank you all for attending today and everybody have a great day. Uh, Dylan Scott, thanks thank for all the great questions, everybody. Thank, yeah, thanks thank for the great you. questions. Thanks, Dylan.